Today's sermon title is uh, Blessed Are the Peacemaker. Uh, we'll be reading from the text, Matthew 5, 1 through 12. Uh, we have very few more verses left, so just every Sunday for the next two, three weeks, just have your Bible app there every Sunday, and it'll be easy. Um, John, if you could come up and read for us. And as he's reading, let's all stand. And when he's done reading, he will end by saying, This is the word of the Lord. And please respond by saying, Thanks be to God. Let's all stand. <clears throat> yeah, the red. Okay. Yeah. Seeking the crowds, he went up to the mount. He went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, "Blessed are the poor in spirit, for there is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth." Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you, and the utter all kinds of evil against your falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks for Good to see you guys. Uh, today's sermon title is called Blessed Are the Peacemaker. I have the easiest time coming up with the sermon titles because I'm just going through the Beatitude and I just take the first half and just go, oh, This is the sermon title. <laughs> Blessed Are the Peacemaker. Uh, thanks for reading, John. Um, before I uh, start with my sermon, uh, I just want to say that um, most of my stuff is taken from two books. So if you want to learn more about the subject of Peacemaker, it's from a book called Exclusion and Embrace by Miroslav Volt. Uh, he's a theologian professor. And uh, Studies on the Sermon on the Mount by Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones, Dr. Martin Lloyd Jones. He's, I believe, he passed away. He's a pastor, theologian. Uh, he was pastor at Westminster. Uh, church in England. Uh, yeah. Maybe first, uh, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time. We love you. Father, we pray, would you come and be with us? Uh, Lord, as we learn about what it means to be a peacemaker, uh, would you help us to really appreciate what you have done on the cross? And would you help us to really love you uh, and be with you? Father, we pray for this service. Would you come and just help us to have peace? Uh, with you and help us to be an agent of peace that makes peace uh, on the earth. Would you be with us? Uh, would you really change our lives? Uh, Lord, we invite your Holy Spirit to come and touch us. And we all in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Um, do you guys know about a group called ISIS? ISIS? I I S I S. Some of you guys heard. It's not the news a lot lately. Um, it's actually a militant Islamic group uh, in Iraq and S Syria or Sudan? Syria, right? Yeah, Syria and Iraq. And basically what they're trying to do is they're a militant group that are kind of killing any non-Muslim people out of their country, out of their cities. And they're uh, killing them and persecuting them. And they're trying to have a Islam state. And they've been successful to a point where they're taking some of the cities away. Uh, U.S. is finally trying to get involved now. Um, and they've been killing uh, two groups. One is Christians uh, and one is Yazidi. Uh, with the Christians and Yazidis, what they do is when they find out that it's a Christian household or Yazidi household, they take their kids and they slaughter them. They take the live adults and bury them alive. Like they bury them on the ground alive. Um, they've been doing this stuff uh, in the name of God. Um, and in, in uh, uh, I think this is a very interesting season as you see Israel also fighting Gaza, uh, Gaza city of Gaza and whatnot, and you see all these unrest. And it really made me ponder about what I'm going to preach about today, which is blessed are the peacemaker. And in an age, an era where war is rampant, to tell people that you and I are called to be a peacemaker, not just that you seek out peace, but you actually make peace wherever you are, sounds so dumb. 
to be honest. Not only does it sound dumb, it sounds very weak as a religion. What religion says when people are coming against you, killing you, slaughtering you, raping you, beating you up, burying you alive, and all these things that are happening on the Middle East, you say, hey, turn the other cheek, for that's the wise thing to do. And today's uh, passage we read, basically, it talks about that, blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called the sons of God. How do you know that you're a Christian? How do you know you're a son of God? Is when you pursue peace, not when you pursue peace, but you actually make peace, even in opposition of war, even in opposition of persecution. If you read the stories of Christians in the 180s and 280s and 380s, Christians are being torched alive as a, like, to lit up a palace for Caesar. They were like literally a human burning torch alive. And Christians did not retaliate. And one of the reasons why Christians didn't retaliate is because that's the teaching of Jesus. That when someone slaps you on the face, turn the other cheek. And when I hear this word, it almost sounds foolish. It almost sounds stupid. It almost sounds weak. It almost sounds like something, how would you survive? You would just die out. And then it brings me to a question like this. Why is there evil in the world? Why are we in need of peace? Why is it that God is calling us to be a peacemaker? You know, why are there wars, uh, why are there wars in the world? Why is there a constant international tension? What is the matter with the world? Uh, why have we had these world war in these countries? Uh, why is there a threat of future war and all unhappiness and turmoil and discord among men? Why is there all these unrest? And in the midst of all these unrest, who is God to say, bring peace and make peace? And not just seek peace, not just run away from the hardship and the turmoil and the war zone. He actually go and make peace. Make peace is what he's saying. Be a peacemaker. And this is how you know that you're a son of God. And this is what God is saying. And you just you listen to it. And it just doesn't make sense. And where is all these evil coming from? And what's interesting is this. The reason there's evil in the world is because there's sin in people's heart. Is that in human heart, there's lust, greed, selfishness, and self-centeredness. And all of this is contributing to world war, contributing to selfishness, contributing to hunger, contributing to all of these injustice around the world. The biggest problem is that there's sin permeating in people's heart. And when this sin goes unchecked, there's wars, there's famine, there's, there's people dying from hunger, there's all these injustice that goes around. The reason there is evil in the world is because man's heart is filled with sin, which manifests itself as greed, lust, pride, and selfishness. And in the midst of all this evil in the world, Jesus calls us to turn the other cheek, to turn, <sighs> be non-violent, non-responsive. Um, when I was growing up, um, I actually loved watching this, or actually more so reading this anime or manga called Naruto. Uh, it's still number one manga, and you're like, wow, why is Pastor Jay at a EM service talking about a cartoon show? Uh, because when I saw this cartoon, it was actually one of the first cartoons that made me realize something uh, actually slightly profound, not that profound, but I was like, wow, that's really true, and I never thought about it. And there's a character named Naruto, who's a, who's a protagonist, who's a hero, and there's a point where he fights this antagonist called Pain. And the reason he's Pain is, he, he, he has a symbolic name, what he means is, there's all these wars that are going on in the villages, and then he is a product of pain, of one village going after another village, and another village going after another village. And Naruto comes as a protagonist and says, I'm here to end the war of the world. Like, I'm going to end the war of the world, and I'm going to be Hokage, and I'm going to end the world of, uh, war, of the, war of the world, and I'm going to do all these things. And then Pain responds by saying, how would, you end the, how would you end the world war when there's so much pain in the world? The reason there is war is because Leaf Village killed a Fire Village member, and the Fire Village member killed Leaf Village member, and then the cycle goes on and on and on. There's a cycle of hatred that goes back and forth, and there's so much pain, and as long as people have pain, how can you stop a war war? And this is all from a cartoon, and I was like, dang, that's some profound stuff. I was like, wow, there's a cycle of pain, there's a cycle of hatred. How do you stop a cycle of hatred? I was like, that's, yeah, it was like mind blowing. But let's think about it a little bit, uh, let me put it in a little bit more, maybe adult form for you guys. How many of you guys love the story of Romeo and Juliet? It's a great story, great 
great love story. One of the masterpieces done by, it was the first, you know, masterpiece love story. Maybe Helen of Troy was another one, but it's one of the, you know, one of the original love stories. It's great. But did you notice that in Romeo and Juliet, they're from a two uh, opposite family that hates each other? <laughs> Romeo is from a one family and Juliet is from another family and their family hate each other to a point where they kill each other and stuff. Romeo's best man gets died, Juliet's cousin gets killed by Romeo and all these things and people hate each other. And one of the friar, you know, like a pastor figure in that time, he says, maybe by you guys marrying, it will end this hatred, the cycle of hatred. He killed you, you killed them. The cycle of hatred might be able to end by you guys coming together and getting married. Doesn't that sound great? You know, maybe love will be the solution to world problem. Maybe love will be the solution to um, the world war. But then if you guys really know the story of Romeo and Juliet, it's actually not a happy ending. It's actually a tragedy. <laughs> Tra tragedy that even though they love each other, it didn't overcome hatred. Even though they love each other, at the end, they had to commit, they committed suicide because they didn't know that the other person died. One person was fake death, thing, uh, fake death and whatnot. And it's not a happy ending, and love didn't conquer people's heart. Even though Romeo and Juliet loved each other, the hatred, the cycle of hatred that existed, did not go away. So when there is a pain on the world that, that you know one country kills another country, another country kills another country, and there's this pain going back and forth. Look at Israel, look at uh, Middle East, and there's all these unrest of wars and another wars, and there's killings of Christians and killings of Muslims and different things. Uh, usually Christians get killed, but I think in India and the northern part, uh, let's be honest, like, I think there's some Christians that are out to kill some Muslims too. So it's not just one way, it's both ways. And one of the reasons is because you hurt me, I hurt you back, and there's a pain, and there's a cycle of hatred that cycles around and around, just like what Naruto said. I mentioned Naruto, by the way, before. <laughs> so the question is, is, what do you do when there's this world hatred of war, war that are like just people have this pain, and there's cycle of pain and cycle of hurt, and that's why people are hurting each other and killing each other. What is the solution? And in the midst of that, why is Jesus telling us to be blessed or the peacemaker? Not only seek refuge for your peace, but actually go and make peace. How does that make any sense when there's all these um, turmoils and, and hatred and whatnot? What's interesting is this. Uh, Miroslav Volk, uh, who is a professor of theology, he gave a lecture about Christian stance on nonviolence. You know, one time he was at a lecture hall and he was he gave a great lecture. He's like, everyone, we should be non, we should seek nonviolence because this is a teaching of the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it said, tooth for a tooth, eye for an eye, you know, whatever. Like it's you get back revenge, exactly what it costs. But in the New Testament, Jesus teaches us to turn the other cheek and do. Uh, uh, you know, don't fight back and do good to those who are evil to you. And by that, you uh, put burning coals in their head. This is the teaching of Jesus, and this is how we should live. Like I'm sure he did it much better than how I'm uh, saying it. And as he taught on nonviolence, one of his another professor, Jurgen Moltmann, stand up and ask him a question. And he says, "Is can you embrace Setnik?" And in here, I guess the professor had a relationship with them, and this professor, Setnik, is a notorious Serbian fighter back in the days, whom had herded people to concentration camp, uh, where uh, this Miroslav was part of. Uh, in his country, in his hometown, he knew a lot of wars and a lot of turmoils and a lot of killings and whatnot, and he grew up with that. And one of the main group that did it was Setnik. And this group was Serbian fighters who had herded people to concentration camp, raped women, burned down churches, destroyed cities, burned down houses, and they slit your father's throat, and all these things, and these were what was done. And in that moment, he was faced with the question, can you still embrace that guy and forgive him? Can you respond in a way there is no bitterness towards him? Can you respond in a way where there is no um, you know, a, a judgment towards him back? Very uh, realistic question, isn't it? What do you do when someone has hurt you, when someone has raped you, when someone has beat you up, when someone has taken your freedom, when someone has killed your father or mother? When that happens, what do you do in your heart? We say forgiveness is such a uh, virtuous thing to do, but what motivates us to be forgiving? What do you have to forgive of, uh, forgive for? What reasons do you have? 
And I would say as a non-Christian, there is none. There is none. But as a Christian, you have more than enough. And we'll impact that a little bit more. The reason for a non-Christian there is none is because of this. So he talks about his hometown. His hometown was ravaged, killed, raped, and, and whatnot. And then he said this, um, there's so many liberal people who love to advocate uh, pacifists. And he himself is a pacifist. Pacifist means you don't respond back with um, action or uh, retaliate through crime or hitting back, but you pacifist means non-violence. Uh, solution. Uh, so pacifists were like uh, Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, he never fought with um, the police or the white people. He always held peaceful protest. Um, Gandhi is another one, a pacifist. And so he said, how do you become a pacifist? And pacifist is a noble idea, but it is un unachievable. It is an idea that's birthed out of a quiet suburban household. For you to go to a hometown where this guy was born, where people were raped, people were uh, caught, people were killed, even if you were to go back to these towns in Iraq where ISIS grew, were killing Christians and killing babies and they're writing on their walls and people are getting killed and whatnot and back and forth, how do you go to them and say, don't fight back, don't raise the sword back to them? It is a stupid idea, and that's what he's saying, and he's saying it much better in a scholarly way. The reason that's stupid is because what incentive do they have to not fight back? What justice is going to happen if you don't fight back? If an army is coming to kill and devastate you and to plunder everything that you have, what justice can you seek out other than the fact that you could actually fight back and kill some of them as you're being taken down? That is the most logical thing for a non-Christian to do. And to call them to have be a pacifist is a dumb idea because what motivates them? If someone killed you, only thing right for you to do is take a life back. That's what he's saying. But the reason Christians are able to be pacifists is because you could rest on the fact that Jesus can take your vengeance. What he's saying is this, if Jesus died and he takes a vengeance for you, and the Bible puts it this way, leave a room for God to take vengeance on you. Don't take vengeance on anyone. Leave a room for God to take vengeance. And the only way you could still have peace and sense of justice when someone come to kill you, ravish you, and just you know, raped your family and took everything, burned everything down, the only way you can have peace and sense of justice is knowing the fact that there is a king who will one day come and judge the evil of the world. And when you believe in this God, you're actually capable of becoming a pacifist. The problem is this, the Christianity, one of, not that it's really a problem, but one of the dichotomy, one of the, one of the things that is really hard is this. When you say you need to forgive someone for Christians, there's two things that are happening. One, when there's people that are wronged on, um, there's a blood crying out when there's blood spill like Holocaust, Jewish people die. The Bible calls those blood cries out for justice to God. So the blood of the innocent, if you read Revelation, the blood of the innocent who's been persecuted, who's been killed, who's been murdered, they, they go up to God as an incense and saying, God, where's my justice? Can you relieve my justice? And in one sense, God comes to relieve justice. But there is another blood that cries out for justice as well. And it's the blood of Jesus, an innocent lamb who died on the cross. And as he died, he take up the place of the guilty one. And another blood pleads for forgiveness. One, one blood of the innocent pleads for vengeance. One blood uh, pleads for forgiveness for the guilty. In God, he's receiving both blood. And both blood are satisfied because at the... The justice that the innocent deserved, the punishment that the guilty deserved was given to Jesus on the cross. It's satisfied. If the punishment has been paid, Jesus is able to forgive the guilty. And that's what we're talking about, right? What do you do when there's the blood of the innocent going up and is asking for justice? Jesus dies on behalf of the guilty. So God is able to bring forgiveness. What do you do when the blood of Jesus goes up and says, God, forgive the guilty. Forgive those who do not know what they're doing. Forgive those who are sinning. The 
forgiveness is able to be done because justice has been met. Um, how can we make peace when there is violence done? Is there such thing as successful pacifists? There isn't. Unless you could rest in the fact that there will come a day someone else will take justice on your behalf. If no one ever stood up for public cause, if no one ever stood up for ISIS, the most logical thing for you and I to do is actually take up arm and kill people and fight back. But the reason, as Christian, God is saying, blessed are the peacemaker, the reason you and I are able to take that stance is because one, God has forgiven them and taken their sin upon the cross. Two, um, because God himself, anyone who is unrepentant, God himself will come and judge the world. So remember I talked about how there's a cycle of hatred? Um, there is, you know, the cycle of hatred that, you know, you killed my village people, so I'm going to kill your village people, and there's just hatred going back and forth. And remember Naruto said, I want to end world war. Like, he's like, Naruto's like, you know, pain's like, um, and he's like, there is all these hatred. Who are you to end world war? You can't end world war as long as there's hatred in the world. You are too small to take the pain of the world in you to stop the war. And in, in Pain's uh, character, Pain's remark, it is so true. No one is able to take the pain of the world. But that's what happened on the cross. The first thing that we learned on the cross is this, that Jesus was able to take the pain of the world on the cross, shoulder it. And that's what he says. He says that the sin of the world rested on his shoulder as he died on the cross. And as you receive forgiveness, inexcusable for yourself, how can you not forgive those who are inexcusable towards you? When you've been forgiven so much of, you start realizing, I am also capable of forgiving other people. The circle of violence breaks when Jesus dies on the cross. Because he's the one who takes the pain. By suffering of violence as an innocent victim, he took himself aggression of the persecutor. He broke the vicious cycle of violence by absorbing it. He broke it by receiving it all on himself. The second thing that we learn from the cross is just that he lays bare the, the mechanism of scapegoating. Uh, the accounts of Jesus' death agrees that suffer, uh, that he suffered unjust violence. The way that Jesus died, he shouldn't have died. The emotional pain, the physical pain, the spiritual pain that he experienced. No one who reads the story of Jesus and goes, man, he totally deserved it. No one reads the story of Jesus and goes, man, he's the most evil person on the face of the earth. No. Maybe if you saw that on Hitler, maybe you would be like, man, maybe he deserved it. But Jesus, whoever reads about Jesus, that he enters history time and to die the death that he died for the things that he has done to heal people, to proclaim freedom for people and proclaim forgiveness for people, everyone sees that he suffered an unjust violence. Jesus takes the unjust punishment of the cross. When we want to take revenge against wrongs others have done, Jesus willingly takes the punishment on himself. And our hatred and madness can be thrown to Jesus on the cross. The reason you and I are able to make peace if someone slaps you in the face and you're able to turn the other cheek, it's not a simple matter of, oh, I'm turning the other cheek. The reason you're able to do that is because the person who is able to do that is because you're saying the, the punishment, the justice that I seek has been met on the cross. The death that that person needs to die, die with Jesus. And the reason I extend forgiveness is because the same death that I deserve, Jesus died in the forgiveness. And if I've been forgiven, He can be forgiven. Let me give it to you in a little bit more practical way in the workforce. There's a lady. Uh, she had like uh, she uh, she had like a she had like a you know, there's like a like CFO and the right underneath. She had a pretty high position. Right? I don't even know what's called. She had a pretty high position in the corporate world. She did a huge mistake where she knew she was going to get fired. And that was a mistake she has done. She actually had a boss. And the boss, and she was worried and for, for weeks she was like, oh my gosh, I'm so worried and I'm going to get fired. I don't know what to do. She has a high place. She's like, I don't want to get fired. I know I have a mistake. Oh man, but I wish I could have a job. And she's just in a turmoil for a while. And then the most surprising thing happened. 
Her boss was CFO, took the her mistake upon himself and said, I made that mistake. Because he knew he himself wouldn't get fired because he's in a too important position so he wouldn't get fired. He's like, oh yeah, I did that. And he covered for her. And then she was so shocked because she was so scared that she was going to get fired. And she comes to the boss and goes, boss, I had, you know, coming to this place was hard. Not only was it hard, coming to this place, I had a lot of bosses. A lot of bosses took credit for my work. None of them ever took credit for my mistake. What made you do that? He said, why would you take credit for my mistake? And he's like, don't worry about it. Like, you would have been fired, you know, and it wouldn't mean much. Like, I, I would have got bad rep. My reputation might have went down as a competent CFO, but it's okay. Like, at least I won't be fired. And, and she was just shocked. He's like, what do you mean? Why would you do that? This is unheard of. This is not what you see in the corporate world. And she was just going on and on to a point where he grudgingly said this. I'm actually a Christian. And if Jesus could take punishment for what I have done and own up to what I've made mistake, I just thought maybe I could take punishment for you. In that moment, he became Christ-like figure to her life, which led her to actually seek Christ and go to church, to actually be a point where I'm like, man, I must seek this God. And this is what it means. The reason you're able to be a scapegoat for someone else, that you take upon someone else's sin, as a peacemaker, what we do is we see Christ, how He was a scapegoat for us, that He took upon our sin, and He died in our place. And we live that out, and the gospel comes alive, even in the workplace, where we say, I will be a scapegoat, a scapegoat for someone else. Scapegoat for someone else. And you live that way, and people are drawn to the gospel. And in that moment, you brought peace. As you saw the ultimate peacemaker, you, as you imitate Christ, you become a peacemaker. Number three thing that we learn from the cross is this, that cross is part of Jesus' struggle for God's truth and justice. Jesus' mission certainly did not consist merely of passively receiving violence. It's not just someone passively receiving violence. That happens all the time, right? Like, you look at the poor, you look at the little kids on the street, someone abandoned them and they become homeless or whatever. There are a lot of people who are receiving uh, violence that was undeserving them. But there is a bigger picture here. Not only did Jesus receive violence, um, suffer violence, but um, as he received violence, there's a transference of forgiveness. Um, you know, if you want, you know, okay, so let's, make me, uh, let me give you an example. Um, uh, is that too gruesome? I don't know. Let's just use it for the example sake. Sorry, that's really gruesome. Let's say someone raped me, and I see this girl or whatever every day, and literally in my head, I hate that person. The only way I could have peace with that person is if I think that person didn't rape me, and if I think that rape never happened. Right? That's the only way I'm ever going to have peace. But this is exactly what Jesus said. He didn't just go wink at your sin. He didn't just go, it's forgiven, or like, hey, I'm just going to forget it. The best thing is that it needs to be forgotten, or someone has to pay for it. Jesus actually paid for it on the cross. So when he sees us, it's as if we never sinned. But it's not him winking at it, it's him paying for it. So he becomes... Agent of not only did he receive a, a, a meaningless violence, but he suffered violence so we would be forgotten of our sin, so we would also be an innocent again to God. And not only that, he dismantled the kingdom of Satan and he proclaimed the kingdom of God. Only way you and I can be in the kingdom of God is if you and I are pure. And only way you and I are pure is not by Jesus winking at your sin and going, I forgive you, I forgot about it. No, he doesn't. That's a false security. Only way he would do that is he didn't want to kill you. Only way he would do that is he himself hung on the cross and died. And if you were to believe in him, that's the only way that you would have peace. On the cross, last week we learned is that um, he took the deceitful and unjust. Uh, he fought when he died on the cross. One of the things that he advocated and he fought for is that he fought for the people who unjustly receive punishment. He's a priest who's able to sympathize with us. When you and I are hurt and goes to God and go, God, 
why did this happen? Why are Christians being killed? Why are this happening? Why are that happening and whatnot? God is able to sympathize with us and know what it means. Um, the blood of the innocent will eternally cry out to God, but that justice of the blood of the innocent will always be met on the cross. The cross of God helps us to be a seeker of peace. The cross of God helps us and calls us to be a peacemaker, even in the midst of um, wars, even in the midst of famine, even in the midst of the most gruesome, heinous things that could ever happen in your life. You could have the most painful experience, but when you turn to Jesus with that hurt and with that pain, Jesus is actually able to embrace you, love you, heal you. Um, he's able to help you forgive and be healed and whole. This is what Jesus has accomplished on the cross. Because of that, Christ calls us to be a peacemaker, not a peace seeker. He tells you to make peace in everywhere that you are. Let's pray.